recording. Um, hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to launch right in into the July edition of Living Histories 2022 with uh, Devaki Bhaya from uh, Carnegie Institution and Stanford University. Uh, Devaki, please, please tell us about living very interesting and very many different histories. All right. <laughs> so um, I, it's a pleasure to be here and an unexpected honor. So I will take, since we only have 10 minutes, a sprint down my scientific journey. And basically this first slide really says how I started um, getting interested in nature and science in these small towns where my father was in, in, in the steel industry, moving on to college in, in Kolkata Presidency College, huge leap to do plant biochemistry at Cornell, return to India to the biotechnology center. And then for many years, I've been at the Carnegie Institution, as Sri Rivia said, and at the biology department, and then some forays that I took in between that I'll tell you about. So on the next slide, oh wait, what happened? Ah, okay, on the next slide, I'm going to kind of make sense of all of my, my uh, journeys, and that is I thought the best thing would be to think about it as institutions I've cared about and people and put it into three categories, exploring, experimenting, and extending. So let's just write straight into exploring. And I think I owe an enormous debt to my parents who, as you can see here in some of these pictures, my father, my mother driving the Fiat, which I still can remember, intrepid experimenters and explorers. And you can see here, we're probably looking at earthworms in the ground and my father here, and we were surrounded by books. The conversation was always interesting. And I think one of the things I wanted to share with you is that what they always did was any question we had, one I particularly remember is when I wondered how the newspaper got made every morning, my father took us at four in the morning to the Statesman to see how prints were put together, which was fascinating. Uh, my two siblings who are rather bigger than this now, Rukmini and Amit, both of them, one a poet and linguist, the other an engineer, and many, many friends, Rahul and Debraj in particular, who shaped my interest in, in all of these subjects. Uh, my schooling in Kolkata, where really all I'll point out is the extraordinary teachers I had, including someone called Sarah Dasgupta, who took us from Chaucer to Lord of the Flies in one year. Very different position when I went to Presidency College, Kolkata, where I got first to experience how politics and Abda, which is conversations in Bengali, can shape your thinking. And then Cornell, which was a completely different kettle of fish, but where I learned really the rigors of doing science and the joy of biochemistry in Andre Jagendorf's lab, and got trained in good methodology by a graduate student, Len Fish. And so moving on then very quickly to what I call my experimenting phase, where um, after my PhD and a short postdoc, I returned to the Center for Biotechnology because we were very, very anxious to do that. But it turned out to be a very difficult time, both personally and professionally. And in a way, it was my first exposure to failure. I'd always been a good student and all of that stuff. And I responded by focusing on teaching. And I thought very much about what kind of science I should be doing in India. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But meanwhile, because I was getting so frustrated at trying to set up a lab, I got a Rockefeller Fellowship to come to the Carnegie Institution to learn about microbes with Arthur Grossman. And in a way, I think it was a roller coaster because I would do science, I'd get excited, and then I had to go back and I stopped all my research. We also, Arthur and I became uh, uh, partners and that made it more difficult. So I decided to return to Carnegie. Basically meant I gave up my position at JNU after almost six years there. And I moved into a very uncertain academic future. But the reason I did it was I was absolutely captivated by the spirit of science at Carnegie. And primarily, because of Arthur Grossman, who made this wonderful statement, I'll never forget. He said, just do excellent science and don't ask where the money is coming from. And Winslow Briggs, uh, the director there, who sort of cut through the bureaucracy and hierarchy completely, and it was science from beginning to end, one, two, and three. 
And at, at, on the Stanford campus, I think the thing that was most amazing to me is all I had to do was walk into a lab, Dale Kaiser's or Stan Falco, or Sharon's, and say I was interested in something, I needed instrumentation, and they would say, yes, let's talk about it, let's do it. And that freedom to do and explore has been truly instrumental in my thinking about science and how to do it. So what kind of science do I do? I'm fascinated by microbes in the environment and you know, naturally call them the invisible majority because I'm sure you'll see the oak trees, but you don't see the millions of microbes doing their job. And the reason I bring it up, and I would like to quote this from a great German um, microbiologist, he said, they're only considered to be the most simple of all existing organisms because they are the smallest, but small and simple is not the same thing. And I think that's the perfect way to describe the science I have done. And that is starting small and looking at a phenomenon in biology, which is beautiful here, but it's actually an active process by which bacteria, cyanobacteria can sense the direction of light and they actually move as groups toward it, individuals and communities. And you can see this in real life. And also, you can begin to model this process, which I couldn't as a biologist, but working with Casey and more recently with Gautam Menon's group, uh, really understand the joy of making predictions through modeling and then testing them through being able to make genetics work in, in bacteria. But always at the back of my mind was this big question, well, this is a beautiful system, you can make predictions, etc. but what's happening in the real world? You know, because mostly microbial communities included are messy. And I think the thing I'm fascinated by is, can we discover rules? And there again, I think working with Daniel Fisher, truly inspirational in making me think about organisms as populations rather than individuals turning on genes, et cetera. And I think that has really changed my thinking about how important it is to mix uh, disciplines. And I'll talk about that just a bit in the end. So then at the very sort of last part of this, which I call the extending phase is in the last five years or so, I've been spending more time thinking about other ways to go. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One is at the Carnegie Institution, which is a venerable institute with great history of science, but has never really explored what it means to the, the environment for doing science, the so-called culture and climate. And I helped with that. And I think it really gave me an insight into how complex these issues are for women, for folks who aren't represented in the, in the scientific majority. Um, and then I made a foray by spending two years at the National Science Foundation. I was told by many that this is not what active scientists do. But for me, it was really an eye opener because I understood how a huge federal agency actually works from the inside. And amazingly, it is individuals who make these decisions. And so I realized you can have an enormous impact on what programs are pushed forward and most interestingly, how you can affect the careers of young scientists. And um, this is just another example of us during the pandemic, as you can see, um, using the California Academy of Sciences as a platform to reach a very large population of young audiences. And I do feel, and I think it's very important for us to consider, and I hope we will have con conversations about this, about how academic institutions can train and encourage a new generation of young scientists and what's the best way to do it. So just to finish up then, I think I want to give a little sense of things that I consider have shaped my career. And I'll do it by using, uh, just reading out two quotes to you. One by the mathematician Ponka, which says that the scientist does not study nature because it is useful. He studies it or she studies it because he delights in it and he delights in it because it is beautiful. And of course the definitions of beautiful change, but I think it really captures something I think a lot about. And the other one, which is by Skinner, which he says that the first principle not formally recognized by scientific methodologists is when you run into something interesting, drop everything else and study it. And I think I've done that. It's, it's an unorthodox way to go about science, but I don't think I could have done it any other way. 
And the reason for that, I think Dorothy Parker said it just beautifully. She said, uh, the cure for boredom is curiosity, but there is no cure for curiosity. And I just love that. And then three little short thoughts. One is that I think for me, these collaborations and conversations across disciplines have been enormously enriching, but they're challenging, they're vexing, they make you tear your hair out sometimes, but I think they're important. And I would say to the young scientists, they require an enormously big dose of humility and humor and persistence. Um, Another challenge I've faced and haven't done a very good job is to try and bring these disparate life parts of my life together. For example, here we are, Arthur and me, with that's not a big subway sandwich, it's actually our daughter two months old at the first meeting. How do you bring together all of these? And I don't think there are any easy formulas, being an immigrant in a country and yet being part of science. All of these, I think, are things I think more about. I didn't think about it when I was sort of rushing headlong into science. And, and so I believe that a life in science is not for everybody, but science is for everybody. And I think I would like to really use a forum like this to think with people about how we foster this both locally and globally. And I'd like to end then with this um, quote that says from, from Picasso that every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once grown up. But if you replace artists with scientists, it's the same story. And I leave you with that, with that thought and I'll stop sharing and happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much Devaki for that very inspiring talk. Um, I am taking Charlie's question from chat. How did these various efforts to extend yourself feed back into and perhaps change your own approach to doing science? That's a, that's a fantastic question. I think mostly to realize that there isn't this one path. If you take the metric of publications and students, etc., you can't really do all the things you want. So you have to take a hit somewhere. And I think I've learned to take that hit uh, in terms of the pleasure it gives me to do other things. It doesn't come easily, I'd say. Um, well, following up on that, uh, let me tag on a question myself, which is that uh, so much of the story you shared was a story of winding roads, meandering paths that would not taken usually. Um, and yet so much of the, the business of science as opposed to the business of remaining a child in science is uh, a pressure cooker existence. Um, as uh, you know, mo most, most, uh, most clear in the context of the NSF experience. So, so how did you manage the trade-offs there? How did I manage to, sorry? The trade-offs between this slow science versus fast science. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I, I'm, I, unfortunately, I can't really, I, I don't think I think of things as trade-offs because you never know when your path, as you said, meandering comes back somewhere. So if you're enjoying doing something, I would say, do it. There, there's always going to be trade-offs. You know? So do you rationally decide this? I don't. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's things I don't know, but that's the way I've done things. Thank you so much on that very, very inspiring note. I thank you on behalf of the audience and I'm closing the recording. <laughs>